series, Mind, the bottom line was strong faith is about doing, not just knowing. First, a question to start off. Did, did any of you guys grow up as little kids uh, with... <laughs> did any of you grow up as little kids and have to share a bedroom with a sibling? Yeah. Yeah, you did. No. Okay. Yes, no. okay. Hands down. Okay. Uh, okay. Hands down. Now, hands up if you still share a bedroom with a sibling. Show of hands. Wow. Wow. I uh, know, just a sibling. Just a sibling. Wow. For those of you that, you guys that raised your hands are awesome. Um, man, I love you guys, but I'm so sorry. Uh, now, I was fortunate enough to always have my own room as a kid. Um, however, I did have to live with a roommate for four years in college, so I do know a little bit about what it's like. For those of you who have, I'm sure you've never had to share a bedroom with someone else. Okay, you guys don't understand at all what it's like. Let me share you my experience of having a roommate. It's the worst. It's it's terrible. It's terrible. If you're not, if you're a neat person and the other person is not, uh, it's difficult. Uh, if you like to go to sleep early, but they like to stay up late, it creates major issues. Uh, this happened for me with one of my roommates in college. Uh, Josh was his name. Uh, Josh liked to stay up uh, till at least 3 a.m. every night, uh, typing at his desk very, very loudly, only a few feet from my bed. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but if you've ever tried to go, go to sleep with the sound of a loud keyboard typing, uh, it is nearly impossible to fall asleep. One of the most annoying sounds in human history. And so, me and my roommate, uh, to resolve this issue, this went on for months, and so I wasn't going to sleep once, and I, I think that semester I had a 7.50 a.m. class. The next morning, he's up till 3 a.m. I'm like, oh, isn't this what all people do? And, um, and so I had to have a very dramatic conversation with my roommate about his keeping me up till past 3 a.m. every night to get him to stop, and he finally did, but uh, drama. Um, <laughs> if you want to listen to hip-hop when you're getting dressed in the morning, and your uh, person that you share your bedroom with wants to listen to country, uh, I can get ugly. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, sorry if I hit any wounds up for those of you who are living that right now and have a roommate and you're having some issues and tension with your roommate. Um, now, when my roommates in college were frustrating me, I would dream about the day when I would get the place that was mine. No more roommates. And in college, I actually swore to myself that I would not have another roommate until I got married. And I can tell you that I still live alone today. I'm, I'm keeping true to my vow that my wife will be my next roommate. No more roommates. Anybody, anybody that's got a roommate feel me on that one? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe you feel the same way about your room situation. Maybe for you it's something else. Maybe you're thinking, I can't wait to get a car that's mine. Hey, high schoolers, you guys feel me on that one? Yeah, a car that's mine. I'm tired of driving the parents' minivan around. Um, again, this was true for me when I was in high school. Uh, I got my driver license, and unfortunately, I had to drive my brother's 1990 Ford Tempo. And let me just tell you, it was a piece of trash. The car was garbage. I was embarrassed to be seen in it. And I dreamed about the day that I would get a car that was mine. And it finally happened my senior year of high school when my mom bought me a 1992 Ford Escort GT. Yeah. Um, and I loved that car. Why? Because it was mine. It wasn't the greatest car ever made, no, but it was my first car, mine. I wouldn't have to share with anybody else. Now maybe you're thinking, I can't wait to go on a trip with my friends. My friends, not having to go with my parents' friends or somebody else that I don't want to go. I want to go with my friends, by myself, my friends. Or maybe you're like me and you're thinking, I can't wait to move out of my family home and get an apartment of my own, yeah? So you guys feel me on these. Last week we talked about how part of being in middle and high school is becoming your own person. 
We develop hobbies of our own, a style of our own, and thoughts about our future that are our own. At the same time, part of growing up is developing a personal faith that you can call mine. And that's what we talked about last week. We talked about how knowing about God and what Jesus says is good, but it isn't enough. If we want a mature, lasting, adult faith of our own, rather than an immature, child phase faith, we need to make faith our own. It can't be our parents' faith anymore. And that means doing something with what we hear at church. Tonight we're going to talk about something else that leads to a mature faith. But before we get there, I want to clear something up for you, all right? Experiencing faith for yourself is not the same thing as experiencing faith by yourself. Basically what it's saying is, to make your faith mine doesn't mean that you're doing it alone, okay? Having a faith of your own doesn't mean you never listen to anybody else. In fact, if you want to have a solid faith of your own, you'll need to involve other people. Maybe, maybe even more than you think. Now, when I was younger, uh, most of the people that I knew who were Christians uh, were adults or older people, like my parents' age or my grandparents and their friends. That is until I met my youth pastor, this guy, John. Meeting John in high school totally changed the way that I viewed faith. He made faith in Jesus seem bigger, better, more interesting, and more real to a young person like me. I wanted to be like this guy. I wanted to be like John. And he's a major reason that I'm a youth pastor today. Then in college, I met this guy, Dr. Smith, who was my, one of my favorite professors. And I also met another guy, Dr. Bounds. Uh, yeah, that's me with the uh, blonde highlights. It was a long time ago. Adam, do it again. But these guys were two of my mentors. They both took me under their wing and mentored me. Now, we need to talk about how faith works in areas like school and difficult situations. Like John, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Bounds changed the way I viewed faith. And of course, there's this woman, Latrice, who uh, was, it was a while ago, you can see, there's, there's my 10 year shot right there. 10 years later, that was 10 years ago, 2009. Um, that's Latrice, uh, the woman that God used to realize my call to be a pastor. Uh, many of you have heard me tell the story of that, how I was going into law enforcement and God used her, Latrice, uh, to lead me in submission. That's her. A lot of you have heard that story before. Now you actually get to see what she looked like. That's her. Then as a young pastor, I met a married couple at my former church in Seattle. Uh, they were a few years older than me. Uh, their names are Phil and Leah. Now I hung out at their house right there a lot. Um, they became like family to me. Over dinner, we talked about things like what it meant to be uh, a Christian and live out your faith uh, amongst people who didn't share the same beliefs as you. And there's a lot of people that aren't Christians in Seattle. And so that was something that was very helpful to me to learn how to love people who didn't believe the same things that I did. I learned so much about how to love people from Phil and Leah. And we're still friends today. I can easily look at these relationships and see how God used them to intersect my faith story. I have a faith of my own, but these people, that you just saw the images on the screen, who will always be major characters in my faith journey, in my story. So true for almost everybody who has a faith of their own. See, it's not about 
you doing it on your own. God sent those people into my life to shape me and mold me into the man I am today and to make me a better Jesus follower. Whenever you hear a story about someone's journey toward God, you always hear about a relationship. Not just with God, but with other people. Now, maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, I don't know. I mean, my small group leader, that one, but I don't really have like a whole list like you do, Pastor Adam. Uh, you will someday. You'll have a list someday just like this of people that you can look in your life that God sent to you to help you become a stronger Jesus follower. Now, maybe you've experienced this already. Maybe your journey has involved someone who invited you to church, youth ministry, Bible study, or a Christian club. Maybe it was someone who helped change the way you think about God. It's going to be someone who impacted you with one conversation, or it might be somebody who impacted you with multiple conversations. Maybe it was someone who you watched and observed. You noticed that there was something different about them. They lived their life differently than other people. Maybe one of those relationships brought you here tonight or brought you here to Five Stone a long time ago. To put it simply, the people around us affect our faith. And that's true in both positive and negative ways. Just like the right people can move our faith in the right direction, well, the wrong people can also move our faith in the wrong direction direction. You've probably seen that happen. Maybe you have a friend or friends who used to be all about their faith, but then they started hanging out with a different crowd of friends. And it's not that they're bad people, it's just obvious that their new friends are pulling them away from God. Here are the big questions. If the people around us have a huge impact on our lives and on our faith, number one, how do we find the right people who can help us in our faith? And two, how do we prevent being affected by the wrong people? I want to start by sharing an ancient piece of wisdom with you. I'm serious, like an ancient piece of wisdom, not exaggerating. In ancient cultures, books were written that contained nothing but wisdom and good advice. Now, in Jewish culture, many of these writings were put together into one book that we call Proverbs. And even though the advice is old, it's amazing how relevant it is to our lives today in 2019 America. Check it out. Proverbs 13, 20. There it is. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Now, if I were to pick one verse that I would have every new freshman memorize at the beginning of their high school journey, this, this would probably be it. Um, because this verse is true whether you're a Jesus follower or or not, it's true for everyone. The people you choose to spend time with will affect your life. It's guaranteed. Hang out with the wise, guess what? You'll become smarter and do life better. Hang out with fools and you will get hurt. We can all think of celebrities who, at 16 or 17 years old, they appear that their life is, is on the right track. People say, oh, you know, that, that singer or that actor seems to have their head screwed on straight. They must have had a good upbringing. Uh, man, they're, they're headed for stardom and, and success. However, then something changes, and they, their life seems to start spiraling out of control. 
You guys ever watch any of those uh, shows about famous celebrities in their life? You know, maybe like Keith Ledger before he had or something like that, you know, shows like that. A lot of times in those situations, when they talk about, oh, he had such a promising career, or she had such a promising career, and then things, everything changes and they start going the opposite direction. Many times with celebrities, it has to do with the friends that they started hanging out with. They started hanging out with foolish friends and surrounded them and were influenced by foolish people who took them down with them. The Apostle Paul talked about a similar idea when he wrote to the church in Corinth. Now, it was a church full of people who were recent followers of Jesus. They had recently uh, become Christians. They converted to Christianity. But they were having a hard time stopping the things that they had been doing before they were Christians when they were pagan Romans. And they were surrounded by people who were living like that, how they used to live. They're having a bad influence on them. So Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15. Check it out. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Have you ever heard that verse before? It's a pretty famous verse. Here's what Paul's basically saying here. If you want to move in a better direction, hang out with people who want the same thing that you do. Especially if, it has, if it's talking about a, a Christian lifestyle. If you want somebody, if you want to start growing your faith, hang out with people that also want to grow in their faith. The wrong influences will impact you in ways that cause negative behaviors and outcomes. And just as she who walks with the wise will be wise, she who walks with fools will be foolish. You've probably seen this happen before. Maybe your best friend started hanging out with a certain guy or a certain girl. Everyone knew that guy or girl had a bad reputation and that they were trouble. He or she was notorious for doing bad stuff. But your friend was clueless. What was the outcome? I'm willing to bet your friend changed because of that new person they were hanging out with. How do I know that? It's not because I'm psychic. It's, a, it's because it's a timeless principle that's universally true. Walk with the wise, and guess what? You will grow wise, but bad company will corrupt good morals. There's a, a famous illustration that talks about if you take a white glove and you walk up to some mud and you throw the white glove down in the mud, what's going to happen? Yeah, the, uh, the mud's not going to magically turn white, is it? No. The mud is going to influence the glove and it's going to become filthy. Now some of you uh, may be looking around thinking, what does that have to do with people we surround ourselves with? Well, it's the same principle of who you surround yourself with. Some of you in here uh, may be hanging out with people who are completely uh, against the Christian lifestyle, who are living immoral lifestyles, who aren't Jesus followers. Um, now that's okay if you have a couple friends like that, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if that is all the type of people that you surround yourself with, if that's who you're hanging out with throughout the week, the majority of people uh, that you're surrounding yourself with being influenced by who are not Jesus followers, and you might be fooling yourself and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try to influence them and be positive influence on their life. But if all you're hanging out with is people who don't have a relationship with Jesus, guess what? You're not going to probably influence them. That's going to probably happen. It's the glove of the mud. They're going to start turning your heart against Jesus. That's just the reality of what it is. That's why even though Jesus calls us to love everybody, we don't have to hang out with everybody. We don't have to date just anybody. We don't trust 
everybody's advice. If the people around us affect us, then we have to be careful about who they are. Right? I mean, a couple of you guys look a little confused here. Now maybe you're thinking, you know, Pastor Adam, isn't it you that encourages us and challenges us to bring one unchurched guest to outreach events? And now you're telling us that we shouldn't hang out with unbelievers? It's Pastor Adam, which is it? Well, first of all, let me say this. I never said that you should be best friends with your bring one or hang out with them at their house. Uh, that's a big difference. Um, I simply encourage you to, talk, to bring them to church or talk to them about Jesus. See, that's, that's, that's different than thinking, wait, that's like, that is, I thought you said you're not. No, no, no. no. There's a difference there. I never, never said you should be best friend with your bring one. That's talking two different things here. Um, to help some of you guys look still a little bit confused, so I'll give you guys an illustration here. You guys know the Target logo, my favorite store. Target. Yeah, red, white, red. Got it, all right? Okay, imagine the Target logo. Um, we're going to talk about inner circle friends versus outer circle friends, all right? Inner circle friends are your best friends. Those are the people you spend the most time with, your bros, your sisters. I don't know what you call your girls, your best friend girls, but um, uh, these are the people that you uh, you spend all the time with at school, after school. You might have a sleepover at their house over the weekend. Uh, your best friends. You guys know who your inner circle friends are. Um, I would argue in middle and high school, all, not most, all of your inner circle or best friends should be strong Jesus followers. Not just anyone who calls himself a Christian, no. Strong Jesus followers. And you guys know what the difference is. Now, I, some of you might be thinking, Pastor Adam, you don't understand. Um, I've been friends with him since kindergarten. Uh, he lives right down the street from me. My parents and his parents are friends. What are you trying to say here? We've always been best friends. Here's the thing, guys. If you're real with yourself and honest with yourself, you notice probably around middle school that he or she started changing. Started getting involved in some immoral activities that they never really did that kind of stuff before. But now they're changing. They're different now. I know we've always been friends. With so you, you guys know if you're real with yourself. You guys know this is true. Here's the thing. Your relationship with Jesus should be the priority. Not your relationship with friends here on earth. Your relationship with Jesus is more important than anything else. Especially when you guys know the statistics. One out of two students, that's 50% of you guys that know. Half of students who attend church through their senior year of high school Statistics say this nationally will walk away from their faith and the church when they graduate from high school. Your faith with Jesus is too important. So inner circle friends, that's inner circle friends. I believe they should all, and by middle and high school, all of those best friends, those inner circle friends, should be strong Jesus followers. Follow Jesus followers like you find here at Five Stone Students, or in your D group, or in your group on Sunday morning. Those are the people that you should be spending time with. Because here's the thing, here's the truth, guys. Your friends are either going to pull you towards Jesus or away from Jesus. There's not a single friend that you'll have that will kind of keep you right in the middle. I'm kind of in the middle with this friend. I'm never hanging out with them. They don't want to pull me towards Jesus. Or no. They're either going to pull you away from Jesus or towards Jesus. Shouldn't you be there certain friends, the people you surround yourself that are you're most influenced by, be people that are pulling you towards Jesus? Guys, no more time, at no greater time in your life will your friends have a bigger influence than, than they have on you right now during your teenage years. Major influence on you. I would probably argue that, that to be just honest, right now with you guys, influence-wise, with most of you, it'd be your parents, number one influence on your life right now. Now, a lot of people, I think, 
I probably gonna say myself as your pastor number two. Nope, I'm not. Uh, number one is parents, and I would say number two, your your uh, friends have the second biggest influence on you, especially your inner circle, your best friends. Me and our amazing small group leaders, we're lucky if we make the top five with most of you. Okay, just be honest, be real. Okay, um, that's just how it is for most students. So your friends have a major influence. So that's inner circle friends. Outer circle friends, go back to the Target logo. Outer circle friends are friends who, some people call them acquaintances. These are people that you eat lunch with at your school, um, you sit next to in class, you talk to your friend with them, you know their, you know their name, you're on a first name basis, you're friendly with them, you call them your friend. Um, they know you, they know a little bit about you, you know a little bit about them. Uh, you might play on their sports team together on the weekends. Acquaintances, outer circle friends. Uh, this is where your friends who are unbelievers, who don't know Jesus, should reside in your life. Um, because there's a far less influence of outer circle friends. Why? Because you don't really hang out with outer circle friends. You're not hanging out with them. Uh, you know them, you're friendly with them, you have a relationship built with them, you care about them, you love them, but you're not hanging out with them. You definitely aren't you know, spending, uh, spend going over to their house or staying overnight at their house on the weekend. No, that's, these are the acquaintances level. This is where your unbelievers, I believe your unbelieving friends should reside. You want to know why? Some of you are like, I don't have a single friend that doesn't know Jesus. All my friends are Christians. Here's the thing. As your pastor, I want each and every one of you to be friends with unbelievers. As long as they're in the outer circle and they're not pulling you away from Jesus on that inner circle, if they're in the outer circle, acquaintances, friend group, that's fine. I want you guys to have friends who aren't Christians. Why? For one reason. Because you may be the only Christian they know. You may be the only person who can lead them to Jesus and in eternity in heaven. That's it. That's the reason. So that you guys can bring them here to church so they can hear the gospel and respond and be saved from an eternity in hell. Or you yourself can share the gospel. That's why we equip it and challenge you guys to share the gospel yourselves. So that at your lunch table or at the sports field or in your locker room, you can tell your outer circle friends who don't know Jesus the gospel. You can lead them to Jesus. I believe you can. Inner circle, outer circle friends. And looking at some of your faces, I can see already... You know right now, you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit right now, that you need to change some of your inner circle friends to outer circle friends because you know they are turning your heart away from God. They're having a negative influence on you in your relationship with Jesus. So this week, I'm challenging you guys to start praying about which friends you need to move to the outer circle friends. Now, I'm not saying you cut them out of your life. I'm not saying you don't talk to them anymore. You're still friends with them. You're just not being influenced by them anymore because you're moving them from inner circle friends to our circle friends. So we have to have those tough conversations and start thinking about that in mind. Do I really prioritize my relationship with Jesus more than this friendship? Bad company corrupts good character. But this isn't just negative. It's equally as true for people who are a good influence on you. Back to the book of Proverbs. Check it out. Proverbs 27, 17. Pull it up on the screen. There it is. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Now, we don't really work much with iron in 2019 America anymore, uh, but chances are good that your family owns at least one steel steak knife in your kitchen. You got, everybody have a steak knife in their kitchen? Okay, so you guys get the principle here, what we're talking about. Now, over time, when you use steel, a knife, uh, it gets dull. Now, uh, if your mom wanted to sharpen her knife or knives, she'd get a stronger piece of metal that she can do this with. 
Sharpen it, right, against another. And what happens is, is when you strike the two of them against each other, maybe she, after watching a YouTube tutorial video on how to do it correctly without cutting herself, uh, the two metals interacting with each other will make the knife sharper. This is also true wisdom when it comes to the people around us. Because stronger friends, pull up the next one, stronger friends makes us stronger. Strong friends make us sharper and better at whatever we're doing, including our faith. Think of it this way, this is our bottom line tonight. If you want a faith of your own, Pull it up, go wait for it, there, oh, there it is. If you want a faith of your own, you can't build it alone. If you want a faith of your own, you can't build it alone. Say it to your neighbor, and if you're taking notes, you can write it down. If you want a faith of your own, you can't build it alone. Hey guys, that's why small groups are such a big deal to us. Every time they meet, they provide an opportunity for us to sharpen each other. We can challenge each other and grow together. Making the decision to engage in your small group or your D group tonight and doing it on a weekly basis is like saying, God, you know what? I can't create these relationships on my own, but I trust that if I put myself in their pathway, you can make the change happen. And trust me, you guys need this. Maybe not right now, but there will come a point when life gets confusing or difficult or a, a crisis arises in your life. There will be a time when your faith feels weak and fragile. Whether it's a big decision or a painful mess, you'll want to know that someone is just a text message away. Someone who cares about you and your faith. And that person is your brothers or sisters in your small group or your D group's leader. That's why one of the best things you can do for your life and your faith this week is simply engage in your group. And I'm not just talking about physically showing up. Maybe you need to, number one, show up mentally. I think we got the slide for that one. Guys. Thank you. Next one. Here we go. Take a break from your phone. Be present in your D group tonight. Maybe you need to start showing up for the people in your small group if they go to your school by actually engaging with them at school, not just here at church. Maybe you've been holding back because you don't know anyone that well in your D groups and it makes you feel uncomfortable to, to share and open up. But if you want to grow your faith, take a step and put yourself out there. For those of you attending Winter Retreat 19 this week, and you'll have plenty of time to open up and be real and honest with your small group because you're going to be with them the entire weekend. So starting Friday night on the first session, don't hold back. Leave your mask at home. <laughs> Or second, maybe you need some one-on-one -on -one attention. You're dealing with some things that are too difficult to, to figure out alone. Or maybe you really want to take your faith to the next level and you've met someone older who seems like they could help. Well, guess what, guys? Tonight is a great day for you to start a conversation with your D group's leader. You can say something like, hey, I really admire the way you intentionally live out your faith. And I could really use some input with what I'm dealing with. Would you be willing to, to meet with me one-on-one -on -one in the next couple weeks to talk about it? Maybe you know someone who could really use some encouragement or truth spoken to them in their world. You know it would be great if you encourage them, but you feel like, you feel like you're not qualified for the job to give advice to anyone. And maybe your next step is to approach that person, hang out with them, and allow God to use you to minister to the other person. See, this isn't just about helping you.
Just like you need sharpening, growing, wise relationships in your life, well, it's possible that someone else needs a faith-building relationship with you in their life. When you show up each week, not only do you get that kind of friendship, but you also become that kind of friend for someone else. Maybe it's time you pray and ask God to open your eyes to how you can build faith in someone else just by being around them. God has been using relationships to reach and grow us through the very beginning of time. It's one of the huge ways he helps us grow our faith. And if we want a faith of our own, one of the biggest decisions we'll make is who plays a major role in our lives. In closing, I want you to think about the relationship that draws you closer to God. Who do you wish you could hang out with more because you want your faith to look like their faith? Now, what are you going to do about it? Are you willing to take a step, make someone a priority, and invite them into your life? In doing so, you may just find that nothing grows your relationship with God like a relationship with someone else. Readers, come to the front. Students, you can bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you for this night. Uh, Lord, thank you again for this reminder in week two of, of mine. To remember that we need to what we learned last week about it's not just hearing, it's about doing and following through what we learn and hear at church. But also today that we can't make a faith our own without other people. Lord, I pray for these students, and especially in deep groups tonight and small groups during winter retreat this weekend, that you'd help students open up and be real about what they're struggling with. And as scripture says, as iron sharpens are, that they would help make each other better and stronger followers of Jesus by relying on each other, not just themselves, to grow in their faith. Pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, divide into D groups. Uh, middle school girls are going to be with Avery uh, and Jennifer. Uh, so you guys can split into two different groups. Uh, middle school guys are either going to be with me or Ben. High school girls are going to be with Donna, and high school guys are going to be with Brian or Heath. All right, you guys are dismissed to do this.